it's a combination between two labs at UCSB. Uh, one's the Benioff Ocean Science Laboratory, uh, which is the lab I'm in, and then another one through the uh, Love Lab. And we're within the Marine Science Institute at, in Santa Barbara. All right, can you guys see by any chance my cursor when I do this? If not? Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay, cool, good to know. <laughs> um, all right, so just to start off, um, our objectives are of the projects is to understand the life history and population status of the giant sea bass. But also, I think what's really important is we're trying to engage the community into ocean stewardship and community science as everyone is a scientist and inform the public about the importance of the giant sea bass, them as an apex predator, and also just the conservation of marine life in general. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's start off. So giant sea bass, uh, they are the largest bony fish in California. Uh, the largest recorded um, weight is 564 pounds back in the uh, mid 60s off Anacapa. And the oldest ever recorded is 76 years. That being said, um, there's a book that came out in 1911 saying that a person caught a giant sea bass off of the Gulf of California and it weighed 818 pounds. So they can get pretty big, and if uh, if you extrapolate the age to uh, or the the weight to the age, that means that that fish was over 100 years old. So they have essentially the life cycle of a human, which is quite interesting, and they're also pretty smart. Um, another pretty cool fact about them is a um, one of the grad students in our lab actually quantified the uh, worth to the dive industry. And giant sea bass in Southern California are worth $2.3 million to the dive industry per year in Southern California, given that there are many people who come out to certain areas or with dive trips just to come and see them. So that gives you a cool perspective of how cool they are. Um, they also, uh, so they start off really, really small and really, really cute. Uh, so this one is about uh, three months old. Uh, so giant sea bass first start off uh, with this really cool. Um, orange with uh, orange pattern with some spots and then over time they get a little brown and then silver and then they get to what we call really uh, you know the actual giant sea bass and they're called black sea bass because by the time they're about 20 or 30 they start to get a more of a blacker tint so what do they eat so these things eat basically everything uh, and they also how they eat is they swallow so they <laughs> with their large gaping mouths they literally create a suction that they're able to swallow anything whole and that does include um, small sharks. Uh, sorry, and to, um, so it's $2.3 million of just that money goes to the dive industry as ecotourism. None of them are caught uh, within Southern California, if that makes sense. Uh, so they eat basically anything. So crustaceans, rays, skates, squid, bony fish, anchovies, sand dab, flounders, um, small sharks, lobster, basically anything that they can get their hands on. <laughs> All right, let's see the next slide. There we go. So this is a, uh, this map is actually of their historical range. Um, they're a bit fragmented currently. But the historical range goes all the way from Humboldt Bay, California, down to down to Baja, California, which includes the Gulf of California. Uh, currently, since the past like 80 years, it's very, very rare to see one north of Point Conception, which is right here. So they're usually seen in this area. And there's believed to be a pretty small group here, um, but majority is here and from San Diego to um, San Miguel Island. And so some known pretty big hotspots, Catalina Island, um, specifically Little Farmsworth and Casino Point. Uh, also big Fisherman's Cove near Wrigley Institute is also pretty common. Uh, honestly, everywhere around Anacapa Island. <laughs> um, the front side is a pretty common one and same with the back side. Um, Santa Barbara Island near the Marine Protected Area is a pretty good spot. Redondo Beach has been a spot for baby giant sea bass, which has been fun. So we've seen some divers go out and see the little small orange guys, which is great. And then Hermosa Artificial Reef, um, which is obviously off of Hermosa Beach. That's been a really, really popular site, actually. And La Jolla Cove area, 
has been um, pretty cool. And I'll, I'll talk more about Hermosa Artificial Reef pretty soon. Um, but let's go back to the history, right? So the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery for giant sea bass started in the, in the late 1800s. Um, from what I've heard, giant sea bass, are a, um, they are pretty whitey, white fish, so they taste pretty good. I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, but the commercial landings in California peaked at 254,000 pounds. Um, just think about that number for a second. I mean, that is a lot of giant sea bass. And what's even crazier is in 1924, it was at 800, 808,000 pounds in Mexico. And so how they were able to catch these is these uh, giant sea bass, are, are they aggregate in the summer to go spawn. And so um, it's great for fishermen, but unfortunately, once they started to use gill nets, they would, they would throw out these giant nets and scoop up all these giant sea bass. And the largest catch was in 1964 at 255 giant sea bass, which essentially was its entire aggregation. And unfortunately, given that these fish go to the same spot every year, that aggregation spot has been completely wiped out and there has never been giant sea bass seen there ever again. So given that they're pretty slow moving or slow growing and they um, aggregate, they're pretty easy to be um, fished out of the ocean, unfortunately. So let's look at the landings here. So from 1916 to 1999, this is both the commercial catch of both in California and in Mexico. And so we see a peak of total landings of 860,000 pounds um, in about 1932. And fortunately, so there was a fishing ban in California in 1982, given that this, this fishery completely collapsed. But from 1932 to 1980, there was a 95% decline in fisheries uh, catch, which is easily saying a fisheries collapse and a very clear indication that this population is in severe decline. However, there are still currently no commercial restrictions in Mexico. Uh, recreationally, you're able to catch one per day, but commercially, um, you can catch as many as you want. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a huge commercial um, like no vessels and stuff catch a ton of them, but um, there are still no restrictions, unfortunately. So uh, this led to the fish being uh, listed as critically endangered in 1996 by the International Union of Conservation Network. Uh, however, they have not been granted federal protections under the U.S. Standard Species Act. Uh, most likely that's because they're only in one state in um, the United States, and usually if it's inter um, if it's between multiple states, that's a interstate clause, which causes it to be federal. Um, a, a study came out, what was that, like eight years ago? Um, it, it was a genetic analysis, and they basically concluded that there are only 500 total adults left um, in that year. That being said, it looks like they're doing pretty well with the recovery, so I do not think that is true, luckily, but that is basically what this project has come to assess. So what happened was a few researchers at UCSB uh, decided to, um, they, they stumbled upon this uh, spot, mapping, spot mapping algorithm that was actually used with NASA. So this algorithm was able to um, spot or identify the star constellations in, in space to orient the Hubble telescope. And Milton Love at UCSB decided to be like, hey, what if we use the same algorithm to identify the spots on a giant sea bass to see if this actually works? Crazy idea. <laughs> and uh, through the research and through using um, the giant sea bass at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, we've actually decide, uh, determined that it is 97 to 100% effective. And so now, uh, given that we know that the giant sea bass have unique spot patterns and that their spot patterns do not change from the time they're born to the time they die, we are now able to use it as a facial recognition software, essentially, and track these amazing giants. So then came the spotting giant sea bass team, <laughs> the project. So what we do, I'm going to showcase basically as if I'm a diver and I see a giant sea bass and how I'm able to contribute to this project. So I go on the website. So let's say I go down to um, Anacapa and I encounter this great giant sea bass and I take a photo of it. And I'm like, oh, I want to show, I want to showcase this to the, the science community. You go on the website and you click on the 
right here, submit report and encounter. All you got to do is drag the, the images and the video here and then give us a date and then the location. And if possible, um, some people have it like the GPS location, if you can be more, more specific, not really needed. Um, and the C4 depth, so the 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 maximum depth you were on, on that dive. Uh, obviously, your name, that's my name <laughs> in my email, but uh, you can also give comments. So for example, um, you know, you might have seen them do some courtship dance, which I can, which I'll discuss soon, or they're just hovering around or swimming or something. Uh, you can give us that information and you could also click on some more links if possible, <laughs> give us a measurement, but I don't know how you could, but you could give a cool, a cool estimate if you want. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's the basic, uh, upload. That's all you got to do. But I wanted to showcase uh, what kind of behavior I'm talking about. So one of these, so usually you're going to see a giant sea bass in the summer. That's because they like to go into the warmer areas. Um, oh, thank you, Grant, <laughs> for the uh, for the link. Um, and uh, so they, so in the summer, they like to do this courtship dance because they're here to spawn. And so what we're going to show here is the male is swimming towards the female and nudging her abdomen, basically saying, hey, I want to mate. Let's do the dance. And their dance is where they swim up like this and kind of go up to the surface while the female releases her eggs and the male releases his sperm. And uh, they do this really interesting dance. And But it's a whole ritual, kind of like birds. And so first, what happens is the male, which is um, the one that's white and silvery, will follow the um, the female, which is usually a bit larger, and they'll start doing the circle and nudge, and hopefully we can go see the um, the spawning aggregation. However, that's actually never been recorded from any diver that we know of, because it usually happens at night. Uh, that's what's believed. But I'm going to show you guys this really cool video. Um, so here we see. So that's the male saying, "Hey, I want a mate." So doing a little dance. She doesn't really seem very interested. <laughs> She's like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But he's he's persistent. Um, but this kind of showcases too. I mean, they will do this right in front of you. So if you go down dive at Casino Point or Farmsworth, wherever, these giant sea bass, they do not really care. Um, yes, uh, let me go back to the ocean floor depth is basically just uh, max depth on your dive. So your dive gauge, if you go down and you saw some giant sea bass at Casino Point and your, your max dive said 48, just put 48. It doesn't be too specific. It's basically just to give an idea of how deep you guys go because it is theorized that that giant sea bass go down to 300 feet. And so we're just trying to see if that's if that's possible. We have some people who do some crazy dives at, at crazy deep, uh, deep depths. Let's say you're working on like an oil rig or something. So it just helps us to give a, a little gauge of um, where they're at. <clears throat> but yeah, so that's that. So what? So once you guys submit the footage to us, what we do is we we run it through our machine learning algorithm. So first, what we do is we actually identify to orient the algorithm. We we, we identify the eye, the front second uh, dorsal fin base, and the pectoral fin, and then we identify all the spots along the fish. And so then, what happens is we run it. And it'll start to run, um, and then it will spit out some potential matches. This one is a perfect match of uh, giant sea bass two to seven. And so you can see here, um, each color coordinates to the exact spot. And so what happens is it'll spit out. So it, it gave us nine here. So what, what we do is the researcher will actually go in and identify me. I will identify which exact um, fish it is and, and if it's a match. And if it's not a match, then we give it a new name. And that person who submitted that um, giant sea bus encounter is able to actually give the giant sea bus a nickname, which is really cute. We've gotten some cool ones like uh, Chewbacca. Sebastian, uh, uh, Fat Albert, which is one at Casino Point right now. Um, Tritail, you know, you've gotten, gotten some fun ones. But yes, I have gotten down to the point now where 
I don't, I, I obviously will run them through the spots, but I know them by heart now. <laughs> so if I just see them, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's giant sea bass 226 or 244 or whatever. Um, so over time, you'll start to notice that they are, um, each one has a unique personality and unique look to them. So they're very cute, in my opinion. By the way, I got to name one, so. Oh yeah, w what was the nickname? I called it Barb's Bass. <laughs> Barb's Bass, there you go. <laughs> um, and yeah, so for us to be able to identify these spots, we obviously need it to be a somewhat oh, decent photo. So on the left are some really good, good ones. We prefer it to be um, perpendicular to the camera or to the person so that we can see all the, all the spots here. And the ones that we can't really do is um, if it's just too murky or if it's a face, um, a, a face photo or if you don't include all the spots in the photo. However, I mean, we understand it is diving. It is murky water sometimes. You know, it's you, you can do what, what you can. So I would still say a submit as many as if you think it's even on the edge or whatever, just still submit the photo. Even us having the photo and the encounter of the, at the date is super, super helpful. So don't, don't let that deter you. Um, not everyone has, you know, crazy camera gear or in the best viz. So we totally get it. <laughs> All right. So what do we have so far? So this project started in 2017, and so far we already have 1,400 reported encounters. I think I think now it's at 1,420, and out of those 1,420, we have a thousand that have been verified and identified, um, which has given us uh, 589 left-sided individuals and 548 right side. So what we do, since each side it has a different uh, spot pattern, we actually identify them by the left sides. So we don't want to do a double count. So for my data analysis, I'm going off of the highest number. So I can so I can definitively say we have 589 identified individuals. Now remember, in 2015, that study said that we have 500 left. So it looks like they are recovering. We already have uh, an increase from the, the previous study. So that's already a huge plus. Um, most of our, our um, encounters are from La Jolla up to Santa Barbara. Uh, but we do actually have a few. We have one um, at Half Moon Bay, one at Monterey Bay, and then one at Santa Cruz. So they are up there. Um, just, yeah. Our top five locations uh, are number one by far is actually Hermosa Artificial Reef. Our number two is Casino Point. Um, and then three is Catalina as the other. So like Little Farmsworth, Big Fishman Cove, and then La Jolla, and then Goat Harbor um, on the, on, at um, Casino or at Catalina Island. Sorry, my light's turned off. I'll turn them back on. There we go. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to basically say, so we, sorry, so we have all the data, right? What am I doing? What, what are we doing with all this? So my number one priority is to create a, an estimation of the current population in Southern California. That, I think that is extremely, extremely important uh, for us to assess our current conservation strategies and to get these guys to higher numbers. So not, not only can we all see them and enjoy them, but because they're apex predators and they really are extremely important for the kelp forests. Um, think of them as like the story of wolves in a forest where if you have wolves, everything is nice and balanced with the ecosystem. But when you don't have them, the deer get, the populations get too crazy. They graze all the, um, all the grass and it, and it completely changes the ecosystem. So these guys are important. They, they help keep populations in check. So they're extremely important. So to do so, we are actually asking for dive logs. I, I believe a few of you guys are in us on our newsletter. So if you guys have submitted photos of giant sea bass, I kindly ask you guys to submit uh, your dive logs from the first time you saw your giant sea bass encounter to uh, current day. And what that allows me to do is standardize diving effort. Uh, so I'm able to create a more accurate model um, for this, this population. Um, they can do that either through an online survey that I have or through the Excel sheet. Um, Nathan, uh, unfortunately, right now, there is not an, a way to match the left side and right side individuals. However, there is, um, we're getting more and more encounters. And so a lot of these fish are actually seen like up to 15 times. 
And so what will happen is one person will, will take a photo of the left side and the right side, which allows us to combine the two. So when that happens, we are now we now change the name to that exact number. So like if it was giant sea bass 227 and 233, if I if we realize that it's the same fish, then we just put them all to the same one. Uh, so a lot of times, as you see, there's only 40 of our fish that have not been encountered on one side, on the right side. So for the most part, they're all about the same fish. Uh, yeah, so please submit the dive logs. And if you do so, we're actually doing a, a raffle, um, which we'll, I'll go into later. But if you submit your dive logs, you actually get into a raffle to win either a $100 gift a voucher to the Spectre dive boat to go dive the Northern China Islands, or you get to choose two tickets to the Aquarium of the Pacific down at Long Beach. Um, I'll talk about that a bit later. But uh, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. <clears throat> Next slide. Another project that we're working on is uh, one of my uh, researchers has decided to understand the parasitic parasites infections on these giant sea bass. So if you look at this photo, and you guys have probably noticed that <laughs> there's a lot of these little, uh, you know, they look like paper clips on their on their face. So these are actually um, a copepod parasite. And so what these guys do is they um, they get stuck into the, the usually the face of the giant sea bass and lodge themselves in and actually suck the blood off the giant sea bass. And so we have a, we have a project through the image analysis that you guys have provided with us to understand um, when these guys get infected, like what life stage, and how this is affecting the giant sea bass. It looks like it doesn't kill them or anything like that, but we're wondering um, what the implications are. So we do not know yet currently, but it is a. Uh, an interesting project for, for sure. And then another project that we're working on, if the slide will change, is understanding. So with these parasites, we actually have noticed that fish actually eat off these parasites, which is now a cleaning mutualism that we've, uh, you usually think of in coral reefs. So like the, the cleaning shrimp that'll um, hang out and, and clean fish with inside, inside the mouths. This is actually the first instance of a cleaning behavior in a kelp forest ecosystem in the entire world. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to describe this, and I want to see if this video will play. Okay, it won't. <laughs> it's been weird. But basically what, what we see here is it's a fish, a giant sea bass that will come in. It gets its mouth real open, and we actually see a calico bass that will come in, yeah, and uh, bite off of the, the parasites. So yes, cineritas are a cleaner wrasse, so they're actually the ones that do this all the time on giant sea bass. And it is believed and recorded on other um, fish as well. But unfortunately, I don't know why people haven't fully described these mutualisms. So we're trying to be one of the first ones to do it within uh, kelp forests. All right. Last project that we're working on is we're trying to understand the spatial patterns of giant sea bass. So through our data, we're able to see, um, let's say, giant sea bass 224, whatever, uh, is seen at Anacapa this day, and then it could be seen at uh, La Jolla another day. And so we're basically just trying to see what their spatial patterns are, because it is, it is um, from anecdotal evidence and a few other papers, it is known that they leave in the summer. Um, and, uh, but uh, one paper said that it's more individualistic. So 30% leave, 30% stay, 30% go out somewhere else. So we're basically just trying to get a better understanding with this huge broad data set in this, in this study site to understand um, how much th they like a certain spot, where they move by, by month, things like that. Uh, Grant, I want to talk to you because this is that's actually extremely interesting. <laughs> so that um, we, we will chat. All right, so as I said before, uh, we are currently doing a photo contest. So if you have photos of giant sea bass, it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter if it is this year or if it is 10 years ago. If you have a giant sea bass and we're able to identify it, you automatically get entered into a raffle to win either a $100 Spectre boat voucher or two tickets to the Aquarium of the Pacific. That also includes if you submit our dive logs, you also get entered into the raffle. Um, and do this by June 5th to be eligible, just FYI. Uh, and then looking ahead, um, as I've said earlier um, in this talk, 
I want to really expand our outreach to Mexico. So the range, as I've shown before, is from Humboldt Bay down to Baja, California, but I don't have any data south of Tijuana. So I want us to, to start, I want to uh, bring some more outreach down there. And I also obviously want to increase um, community engagement with, with you all. Uh, we are all scientists here. Um, and uh, just trying to just build our out, uh, internet presence um, through doing things like this. And I also want to increase outreach to the fifth fisherman community because I currently, um, if you catch and intentionally kill a giant sea bass in California, you are subject to six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. However, fishermen catch them all the time and catch and release. So I want them to feel like it's okay to send us the photos and, and release them in a safe manner. They will not be in trouble. So I think that's kind of the issue um, currently. And Barbara, uh, great point. I forgot to mention that. Um, so for the spatial pattern uh, project, I'm actually this summer, um, along with Nat Geo, we're going out to um, tag some giant sea bass. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be scuba diving at Anacapa and actually um, injecting the uh, tags to basically record them from a, uh, and it'll ping every two minutes and we'll see them go, um, anywhere up to eight months. So we're trying to basically in a systematic way, track them and couple that with our current data. Um, so great, great question, Barb's. Um, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And so, yeah, so that is basically a rundown of the project. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I know we're gonna have some questions. So I'd like to open up the floor for a Q and A. I have a question. This is Nathan. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys thought about like installing cameras underwater to do like time lapse, you know, where you don't have to require divers going down, but just having like a time lapse camera capturing images periodically? Great, uh, great point. Yeah. So we've, um, I'm teaming up with the project uh, with a group that we're going to actually do that Hermosa Artificial Reef mm -hmm. to quantify the cleaning behavior. So we're actually going to have some time lapse cameras. Um, this summer uh, to, so basically, so we can be like, okay, we will be able to quantify every single fish that has giant sea bass that has been at Hermosa reef um, from June to September. Um, the problem that we're currently running into is uh, that like the battery life, um, they don't last so super long. It would be great. So I know the Wrigley Institute has like a live camera feed my dream would to be had to have that like casino point, uh, but as that that has definitely been in consideration. That's a great question. Is there a way to tell visually when you see one, whether it's a male or female? Uh, great question. So let me go back to um, what slide was that on? That was. Yeah, so this is a dramatic overview of what they would look like, but the male typically has a more flat abdomen and is a little more sil silvery uh, with a straight lateral line. The females have this black spot under their eye and they tend to be a lot darker. And so every single time a person's like, oh, a, a giant black sea bass, I caught this one, it's usually always the females because the females are typically get a much larger. Uh, and so this is more in, in the summer. It is believed that the giant sea bass do a bit of a color morph. So the males typically have more spots or more defined spots in the winter and they're a little bit darker. The females are usually always, always dark. So yes, um, however, it is a little bit hard to say given the photos that we have. Um, it's a little bit easier in the water. So if you see one that has a flat stomach, it's typically a male. If you see one that's a little bit rounder, it's a female. And a black spot under her eye. Yes, yes, the black spot right here. Um, and then I have a question about uh, how uh, large is like a general range for like one fish? How, how far does it like kind of travel around? And also like, is the general behavior that like they go down uh to like mexico during the winter when it gets colder or yeah great question so currently it's believed that about half of them stay at, at around the same vicinity of the area so let's say we, we see them at catalina 
they usually stay around the, either the backside or the front side for the entire year. However, we have a few that we've seen all the way that go from La Jolla to Hermosa to Catalina. So it seems like we have a few that are kind of individualistic. Um, we do not, they, they, so they have a somewhat of a seasonal migration pattern, but not, we don't see a big mass migration to Mexico or up north or, or anything like that. It is believed that in the winter, they actually go down at depth. So they leave the sites and they actually go down to about 200, 300 feet because we've actually had some um, deep ROV surveys from some oceanographic cruises send me some, some videos of them recording them in like November at like 200 feet. So that is the current belief, but that is uh, still an unknown. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so what do you think that draws them into those top five habitats? Is it the food source? Is it? Um, so it's hard to say that these are the top five sites. I, I, I'm mm. going to say it's probably the top five most dived mm. spots. Um, San Clemente Island, I actually have a, a, a theory that they're pretty popular then because there's been a few charter dives and they've seen, like there was one uh, last year that saw 22, mm. um, which is crazy. So it it's hard to definitively say if these are actually the top five sites. I I just think that these have a lot of divers there that see them. Um, that being said, um, clearly there's an emphasis on like these areas and food availability. So as we all know, like Catalina, these islands, they're beautiful cut forests and they have a lot of food sources. So that's definitely a, a factor. And what eats a giant sea bass? Um, large fish when, uh, we'll eat them when they're a lot smaller, but by the time they get to like 200 feet, <laughs> they're an apex predator. Nothing's eating them. <laughs> 200 pounds, you mean? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. 200 pounds. 200 feet <laughs> <would be> gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. <clears throat> I know with, um, certain whale conservation projects, they, you know, map barnacle patterns on whales heads as a way to identify them. Have you guys interacted with any of those researchers just to compare like algorith algorithms and data analysis and things like that? Yeah, so we actually partnered up with a company called Wild Me. I can, um, I'll send the chat in there, Wild Me. Uh, so they host our, our, our algorithm. And so they have a bunch of others that are able to identify species like zebra, lynx, manta rays, whale sharks, um, things like that using their own machine learning algorithms, but they have incorporated a bunch of other spot mapping tools to do so. So they've actually done that. Whales, they have one for um, their uh, their tails, like the, the shapes and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Grant, um, I do work with Chris Lois and stuff. They actually are doing some uh, camera trapping work. And uh, there's a video that they sent me where they saw a great white shark at Carpinteria Beach and a giant sea bass hanging out together. So the great white just swimming in and the giant sea bass came right after. And they're like, whoa, some, some two huge predators just hanging out. <laughs> um, they're probably there to eat some uh, stingrays and skates. And then uh, you say that uh, like the historic range like went all the way up to uh, like Humboldt or whatever, um, mm -hmm. but that like the modern range is like south of uh, south of like well like Southern California and lower. Oh, what about those like three sightings that are up near like uh, Half Moon Bay and like Monterey on the tracker? Are those like verified sightings? And is that like abnormal to see those that far north? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to get to it. Um, yes, they it is abnormal. So here's the thing. So Monterey Bay, as probably a lot of you know, why can I not get to this photo? Um, has a lot of diving effort. So we um the last one we saw was this one um in 2020, I believe. And so they are definitely here. But Monterey Bay has a ton of divers and a lot of effort. So the fact that we're not seeing them probably means that they're not super common. Um, 
because because we'd have done some outreach there but that that's a great question so if you guys ever go down there and see some please let me know <laughs> and submit it to the project well we live up in the bay area so i really want to get a time lapse camera down there just uh oh my god really that fun. would be incredible um if you do um email me uh we can potentially send you some <laughs> uh i would I guess, love I, I guess just habitat wise like you know like point lobos or like what what would be the kind of the areas the specific areas up there that you think they'd hang out in us oh good question um there what's the what's the dive um it's a beach dive it's just north of the monterey bay is that china cove uh monterey, monterey beach yes that one um that's one i have a theory that they're at i i, I really think that, that that they would be there somewhere where that's that's pretty kelpy they like to um hide under either like rocks or just dense kelp um they're they're not skittish but they like to feel like like they're in like a den okay. um, so i would think somewhere around there um they're probably around big Sur. it's just hard to get there yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah so if you are interested in that uh i let's chat <laughs> uh oh, this is a community science project so i have like six people who are who are out and sit and collecting data for me um giving them camera stuff so this is this is not my project per se this is this is a community effort so um i'd be willing to help with anybody and then um you, you said that like they you guys haven't filmed or there's like no footage out there of like the like meeting ritual because it happens at night it, has there been like any effort uh to like try to catch that on a night dive yeah there hasn't really been much um it we also don't know where it happens my theory is that it's in the water column so probably they um They'll start to do the courting dance probably like 60, 70 feet. And then it's believed that they'll swim up together and and kind of like grouper in the Caribbean. They'll swim up and, and do the dance probably until about like 20 feet. Um, I would probably say to go out off of, off of like Catalina and kind of just sit in the open ocean at night where if, if you know that they're around and just go for it um the problem is that it's just so dark i mean it could be it could be happening like 100 feet from you and you just wouldn't know but mm -hmm. that being said go for it i think that'd be the coolest thing ever <laughs> um i am like i said i'm tagging them starting in july hopefully we can see maybe if they do that um in a certain area and then if so i'll let you all know so because that would be a cool dive charter <laughs> Um, mm. I mean, Malibu divers, here you go. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking already that would be a fun trip. That would be, that would be incredible. Um, like just sit at Casino Point for a couple of nights and, you know, have everybody turn their video cameras and lights. And, yeah. I don't just, know if the lights would bother them though. If they, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, when people go out and dive and flash lights at them, they don't seem to care. I mean, they don't, it's not like you're going to go eat them. Right. Uh, so it's so docile at Casino Point too. Oh my gosh, they'll come right up to you. They'll there's some that'll just come up and like show you around or basically cool. stick you out. So to the people who um haven't dove casino or 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 want to get into diving, um that is one great excuse to get into it. If you want to encounter a fish the size of a of a grizzly bear, just you know. <laughs> hey, Andrew, <laughs> very good. Andrew, have you have you done any work on the valiant because every time i dive a rebreather i see a mating pair giant mating pair on the valiant every no. time. so when you're bubbless and really quiet they i've had them spend half an hour with me oh interesting and yeah probably I, I, three 300 plus and 275 like wow. big mating pair wow yeah i, I figured rebreathers would definitely help with that um i mean it'll definitely help with your tagging project too yeah that's a good point can definitely we can talk yeah yeah i might need to to buy some equipment <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and uh, i don't know if you know look in men and and um uh davis uh, east davis uh, what's his name researcher great the, doing the hammerhead stuff down in el bajo they oh, okay they went to rebreathers for that reason it's 
those big fish are acoustically sensitive, even though they're pretty chill. As There's see, one up lot, in Malibu. More free diving and a lot more on rebreathers than we do open circuit. So the biggest There's, aggregation I ever saw was back east side of back side of, of Anacapa in 84. Had to be 300 animals. It was giant school, just aggregation of migrating fish. Yeah, and and also like an eighty four two really that's... early sighting of such a big group. So yeah, that's that's lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's why I remember it because it's just so like no way. Yeah, <laughs> and we can have a conversation um, about cleaning stations because if you're diving to same point a lot, you should be seeing it every dive. Yep. But yeah, I, uh, flat rock and all of it. I see the scenery is up there cleaning almost anything uh, all the time. Yeah, I have I people pointed out to students all the time. I have people tell me that there's a little um, rocky outcrop area at Little Farmsworth where they've seen it as well. So it definitely happens all over. I mean, Santa Rita's are cleaning fish. So they, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, I dropped down my email. If anybody wants to email me or any questions or wants to collaborate on a project, I'm always open. Nathan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, so we can go out and, and draw some cameras. Most definitely, yes. We just have to figure out what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm happy to put together a night kind of class and like go look for them, see if we can record them off Casino Point. Yeah. I'll let you know. We're, we're going to tag some off Anacapa and I'm trying to do some off Santa Barbara Island. We'll see where they go. And if we see some cool correlations, I'll let you guys know. We can go get some boats out and get, get some flashlights. Yeah. It'd be so fun. I mean, I mean, if you haven't done a night dive out in the open ocean, I already say to do it because if you put lights down, you'll see it squid will start to like swim at you and you'll see some cool tunicates and some deep sea animals. So even if you don't see giant sea bass, it's a great time. Wow. So black water dive. Black water dives. They're, they're, they're my favorite. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So we have a nighttime videoing of mating and then we're going to do a black water night dive. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and off of Malibu would be good too, because because um, it gets pretty deep pretty pretty quickly. So you'd see some, some deep, deep Big sea animals. Doom and Little Doom, they're definitely a couple resident. I I've seen one every year since he was or she was. I don't remember. Uh, at least twenty years of going from silver and very spotted to darker and darker, and they're they're there every year. Yeah, we've uh, we've got one at Leo Carrillo a few years ago. So they're they're in, they're in Malibu for sure. There's one that hangs out in off of Latigo Canyon Beach, yeah, and he's really super aggressive. He swims <laughs> up, yeah, like he's not a Casino Point one. No, he swims really fast right at you, and he swims up to you, and he he's looking. For, I think there's a lot of spiros. Oh yeah, so I, yeah. So I think he's habituated to that. And so as soon as he figures out you don't have anything, he takes off. Yeah, if you're out spearfishing with them, um, be careful for them to, they will take away, they will take that fish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. It felt like I shouldn't even put my hands out. You yeah, know? no, don't. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was trying to show him my hands, like, no, I don't have anything. And then he started looking at them. I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're definitely apex predators. Don't mess with them. Andrew, as, as a newbie, can you tell me like what what you mean by that they are actually smart, like things that they do that make them different or smarter? Oh, yeah. No, they will um they will come up to you. They'll check you out. Um, and the ones at Casino Point, they obviously know that they're in a protected zone because they're just, they see, they don't, they're not scared. So they'll actually some right up to you and they'll basically ask you for, for, for scratches. Um, because, because of those parasites, they, they've, they've learned now that, that they want to, they want to get you scratched. And, um, there's been recordings of, of, of them noticing people based on like their dive gear and just following them around at a dive. Like there's people who, you know, like dive masters who, who dive the casino point like every day. And it's like, Oh, Hey, that's, you know, that's fat Albert just hanging out and they'll just follow you along. So, um, they're pretty unique creatures. Um, and they, they, yeah, yeah, they're pretty smart. Thank you. That's cute. Yeah, they're very, they're very, they're gentle giants. That's how I like to put it. 
unless you have food, like a big fish at them, then, you know. <laughs> All right, thank you, Andrew. We're yeah. at uh, the hour. Uh, I'm going to hang around. Andrew, if you want to hang around, we can sure. do the behind the scenes talks or whatever, but no one is required to stay, obviously. And Ask yeah, more thanks, Andrew. This is it's really exciting to see what you're doing. Like awesome effort. So just really thanks for sharing that. And uh yeah, it's really great to great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. And uh shoot me an email. We will. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.